Thank you very much. If I could ask Benjamin just to take a seat, and uh, we will now start our discussion panel. We'll be rejoined by Julia from Facebook, as well as Paul Bittar from the British Horse Racing Authority, Florence Amalou from Equidia, and Tonya Safe from Coral. I'll take my cue from Benjamin and uh, walk the floor this time, I think. Very interesting presentations from both Facebook and Twitter. Um, we appreciate that. It's given us some real insight. If I could probe further a bit more um, specifically for racing and betting, first off to ask Benjamin uh, what you think Twitter offers to the racing and betting sector above traditional media. Thank you for the question. Um, well, first, beyond traditional media, uh, I'd like to stay with traditional media. I think, I've, as I've just presented it here, um, Twitter can be a nice continuation, you know, because Twitter is about amplification. So you can use Twitter as the glue between your different marketing initiatives to create the link between, you know, your outdoor, your print, your TV strategy. So this is the first point how, you know, it can help traditional media. Then to go beyond, there's definitely the live aspect of the platform, you know, the immediate response we talked about. This is something that no other platform, I believe, um, can help you on. When something is happening, when there's a discussion about a race, about a poker tournament, or when the odds are constantly changing, this is where you can jump in the right um, conversation. So this is how, you know, with this uh, live aspect that Twitter can, can help you. And, um, and finally, beyond traditional media, I'd say that uh, when it comes to advertising, maybe unlike another platform when it comes to traditional media, um, you'll have on Twitter the measurability. There'll be no waste. When you'll be doing t advertising on Twitter, you will pay only when there's an engagement. You'll pay only when someone click on the URL or check the video that you put inside the tweet. You know, it won't be about the noise and you could be measuring what you're doing. And I think this point is actually um, valid for also uh, Facebook and all other platform when it comes to, to be online. And from your point of view, obviously one of the challenges we have as a support is to attract new customers, bring new people into the sport and engage with them to broaden the appeal um, from both a racing and betting perspective. How can Twitter help us achieve that? Um, Twitter is a network of interest and information. And here I want to focus on the information bit. When you are running campaigns about, when you're running informational campaigns, because this is how you want to acquire new people to talk about what you're doing and what's the advantage for them. Twitter is a great platform because you could jump in conversations that are talking about a specific interest New, cl new clients for you, maybe people interested by horsing or football, but who've never bet before. So if you jump in a conversation by bringing them the right content, saying, oh, do you want to know more about horse racing? Do you want to know more about this game? Like um, Skybet is doing, you know, linking to Sky Sport. I think this is the first way to um, actually drive new, new, um, new client acquisition. Um, then I think something that, that you could do is also um, through advertising mainly, you could reach the right people, as I said, at, at the right time. And today, it's possible on Twitter, from the moment that someone is going to tweet a specific keyword like betting or horse racing, you can actually put a promoted tweet straight away in front of this person. So this is extremely powerful to reach people who at least have demonstrated an interest. And with the concept, uh, the concept of similar users, you can also reach people who have a similar interest graph. It means you know, it's based on what they're doing on Twitter, what they follow or what they do. We can actually say that, okay, Jason is interested in football and poker and is following pokerstars.fr. I am interested in the same kind of interest, but I'm not. Pokerstar, if they decide to target all the similar user on Twitter, I could potentially be reached by this ad because thanks to the interest graph, I'll be identified as someone that potentially could be interested um, by this. So I think you know this um, this mix of um, reaching the right people and using the discussional and the conversational and the live aspect of the platform to you know bring 
content to the, to the relevant pe people is the way for you know, the industry to um, uh, drive new client acquisition and to help them um, to, to help you educate all these people. Thank you. And from your point of view, Julianne, how can Facebook be integrated effectively within traditional marketing campaigns? So you, you have to consider Facebook um, as, as a massive distribution platform. Um, obviously, we have a lot of users. It's growing every day uh, in new categories. And um, it's, it's, it's highly likely that the, the people you want to talk to are on Facebook. Actually, we just released some numbers in the US. But every day in the US, between 8 p.m. and 10 p.m., you have more people using Facebook than people watching TV and all channels combined. So there is a lot happening on Facebook, a lot of conversations happening on Facebook. And just as Benjamin said, with these new social media platforms, you can do very interesting targeting. You can target on Facebook people who are living in Paris, uh, who did the check-in here or there, fans of that page, uh, who talk about that and put them, you know, the right content in, in front of their, their, their eyes. So I think it's complementary. Um, I think it's very interesting, uh, very important to see Facebook as a distribution platform, digital one, not just the web, but also mobile, which is, you know, the place where people are going to spend more and more time. Um, but I think it's a, it's a very good complement to existing um, brick and mortar marketing campaigns, because just a lot of people spend time on our uh, platforms. And we now have the right advertising tools to reach them wherever they are, and uh, be it on the web and on mobile. One of the questions I often get asked about social media is that the pursuit of fans, followers, likes, etc., retweets is all very well and good. But other than that, how do we measure the success of social media? Should I answer that one? If you could, please. Yeah. So. The, the way we work with our customers right now is around performance. So we want you to know that when you invest one euro, you're going to make two, three, four, ten euros. Depends of, of the business you are in. But it's all about the performance. Facebook two or three years ago was more about the branding, uh, with the ads that you could see on Facebook on, on, the ran, on the right side. Right now, it's all about performance. People who invest on Facebook, especially in your category, they invest to create conversations, but more importantly, to get new users, to recruit new, user, new users, new web users, new mobile users. So it's all the performance, and that is very easy to track, especially on mobile, which is the place where, it's where, where everybody wants to be. So for me, it's all about the performance, and we have the right tools to track that. And all the people who are doing the best use of Facebook are gaming, are real money gaming guys. And once again, when they, when they, when they invest one dollar on Facebook, they expect two, three, four, twenty uh, dollar in return. And again, finally, to finish off with you, Julian, uh, specifically then with your um, in-play app with uh, Paddy Power and the future um, that you see really for real money gaming, uh, where do you see, how, how has it been received so far and where do you see the future developing from here? So, so far, so good. Each partners, uh, once again, it's GameSys 888 and Bonza in the slots category and, and Paddy Power in the sports betting category. Uh, each one of them is investing in a very different way. Um, but it's too early for us to tell if it's going to be a success like the original uh, Facebook gaming platform has been. We just launched with three companies in one country, which is the UK. We're going to launch more countries. We're going to launch more games, more categories. Uh, but, you know, as I said, Facebook is the biggest gaming platform in the world. So is, there is definitely some appetite for that. And um, once again, I, I keep saying that, but I strongly believe that Facebook and the newsfeed is made for stories that you guys are publishing. I really want to see these stories where you can say, hey, I'm going to bet five pounds on that team, and where people in one click can bet with me or against me, which is what people do in real life. And we believe that the newsfeed is, is made for that. We still don't know which category is, is going to win, if it's going to be you know, poker, slots, bingo, or sports betting. Thank you. At this point, could I bring in Paul Bitter from the British Horse Racing Authority and also Florence Amalu uh, from Aquidia. I would like to get a perspective from racing now, really, to see how social media has changed the way that racing engages with its customers. Well, um, for us, it's part of an integrated um, communication strategy. So social media and particularly Twitter for us are critical to that. Um, we have uh, actually disappointingly small number of uh, followers actually looking at some of the numbers earlier. Um, I think on our BHA account we've got about 16,500. 
once you distill out what I'd call the outliers, um, the reasonably benign group at one end and the slightly mad group at the other, um, we've got a pretty, criti pretty large critical mass that gives us a lot of feedback on issues. Um, we also have a group of what we would call key opinion formers amongst our, amongst our Twitter followers. Um, so in terms of pushing out our messages, um, it is by far and away the most effective medium that we have these days. And, and that's because it's about what's happening now, really. So in terms of communicating information from the race course, responding to issues, um, I personally spend quite a lot of time travelling, so I spend a lot of time on Twitter and Facebook, but Twitter more so from a work perspective, um, and I'm constantly feeding back to our comms team to inquire about issues that have been raised on Twitter, about the running of a race or about an issue that's taken place on the race course. So we can deal with it instantly and we can get a message out to either clarify it or communicate what's happened. So um, it's unquestionably now, I would say, the most effective and probably the most important part of our communications platform. And from your perspective, Florence? For us, it just opened the doors. Uh, it's another way of showing horse racing. Uh, we can explain things differently than the uh, a TV broadcaster normally does. Uh, it means that um, we have to be creative in a new and try to find new ways to show uh, horse racing. Um, and then we are really deeply into the social media system now for two years. Um, we're still learning a lot. Uh, we're trying to have a test and learn approach uh, to uh, try things and see what works. Um, and it's quite successful at the time because it, we can touch new people, talking to them in a different way. So it's quite uh, interesting for us. And that really leads me on to my second point, was how can social media therefore open up the doors really uh, to help us promote horse racing to a much wider audience, not just domestically, but also internationally? That's the huge question and depends on the what your strategy is. Um, at the time, we are still mainly focused on French people, French speaking countries. Um, so we are very um, active on Facebook and Twitter. Um, we have a a nice rate of engagement of 30%, which is not too bad for the industry, I think. Um, now, questions are coming out uh, with YouTube, and uh, and uh, we, are, we are trying to find ways to talk to larger po population, even non-speaking, non-French speaking countries, uh, using more graphics, computer graphics, images, and uh, we are thinking of, um, I don't know, Everything is, uh, is uh, wide open, so now we just have to make decisions on those things. But it certainly uh, um, enables us to talk to more uh, people in different countries and to, uh, to uh, go abroad. And your view, Paul, obviously is not just the BHA, but there are a number of initiatives in the UK, uh, Racing for Change, Great British Racing Now, um, uh, both, again, domestic and international. How have you found that social media helps to open up those communication channels for those marketing initiatives? Well, I think um, what we find is that actually those issues are not, they're not domestic issues. The reality is that every jurisdiction tends to be dealing with exactly the same set of issues. You're just invariably at a slightly different point in the life cycle of where you're dealing with that issue. So, you know, as an example, this year we've had, you know, we've had a lot of time spent um, dealing with issues like the Godolphin um, anabolic steroids case, but that is a live issue in every racing jurisdiction. It just so happened that it was highlighted in Britain. Social media played a huge role in terms of us um, taking feedback, understanding what, you know, from a consumer perspective, um, what the issues that the consumers were looking at were. And I think that's really important for, for us because we quite often take quite a producer, fo you know, facing view. Um, we had an issue this year where we had a rider tweet um, uh, he got suspended on the day. He actually won the race, but he got sus he, he, he got a two-day suspension for whip breach, and he tweeted, um, fuck the two-day ban, um, get in there, I won or something. And we then actually took action for the first time against so a licensed person for their use of social media. Um, he got a disappointingly small fine, I would say, from our disciplinary panel, but it actually sort of set the benchmark. And in Australia last week, <coughs> I think it was last week, or in recent days, there was an owner who was fined $4,000 
um, for comments that they made about one of the gov regulatory bodies out there. So uh, the issues are, they're not domestic issues. Um, this week we released that we were going to, we were planned to race on Good Friday next year. Most of the feedback that we got on that issue actually came from international jurisdictions by way of social media. So I think that the, the thing for us is that it's about, it's actually that they're international issues rather than domestic issues and via social media you actually get a, you get a, a genuinely international view from a consumer perspective of, of, of that type of issue in the sport. Well, it's interesting to hear you say that because obviously the globalization of the sport is something we've been talking about for many years and with social media it's now really starting to become a reality I in real time. And a, a question, if I may, for Benjamin again. Um, I noticed the deal that uh, Twitter did with, uh, through Amplify with the NFL last week to um, show uh, highlights and other content. Do you see this as perhaps, perhaps being the future for sports, um, to be able to um, broadcast additional content via uh, social media? Is it an opportunity for racing? Yeah, definitely. This is actually this special relationship between Twitter and TV. So maybe for those of you in the room who don't know what Amplify is, so Twitter Amplify is um, one of our initiative to go to um, content creators um, or content broadcasters, so like the NFL, the American football in the US, and we take this content, we put it on the platform, and we just help these partners to actually monetize this, this content. For example, in the NFL, we'll be, um, we'll be showcasing the highlights of the big games, and then an advertiser could come and promote this. In France, actually, it happened for the first time, thanks to the French team, last Saturday, with a show, uh, Danse avec les stars, uh, so you see that any kind of content um, can be put through Amplify. So to come back to your question, uh, definitely as soon as you know um, the content is talking to a specific audience and when it comes to racing, when it comes to sport, there's a huge audience on Twitter for this. Um, we'll be more than happy to work with you know local representatives of all these um, different bodies and uh, let's make it a reality. More than happy to do this. I don't know to what extent in the UK you're already working with us, but. Uh, I'd love to follow up on this. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> Sounds like a great opportunity to me. Thank you. Um, we heard a lot of examples from both Julien and Benjamin about betting. Um, some really good examples. I think probably the betting organizations have been uh, perhaps more forward than the racing authorities uh, so far in terms of harnessing the potential of social media to promote the product. And I think that's followed through with the numbers of followers, fans, and likes, and so on. So to bring Tanya in now, um, it'd be interested to hear a bit more about how you've had to adapt your marketing and communication strategy to fit social media channels. Sure, okay, thank you. Um, so it's a space that's con con constantly evolving, and we adapt and change things on a test and learn basis. We try lots of different things, and we do learn from the data what works and what doesn't very quickly. Um, the our, our fan base on social media are young, so 75% are males under 35, and 90% regularly bet on football. So that does, um, we, we, a lot of our communications and the way that we speak to the fan base is with those insights of our customer at the heart of what we're doing. Um, as we've heard quite a lot today about the environment of social media and I think as a brand we have to be very conscious of the fact that people are in the space primarily to interact and socialize and not to buy and it can that reality can have a negative effect if you're constantly pushing out sales or marketing messages and we do split out the activity so we do run advertising on both Facebook and Twitter but we also have our community most of the content that we, that we have in within the community is about entertainment and fun. Obviously, it's got a betting and sports theme, um, but we certainly don't use either of the channels to just simply push out sales messaging. And that raises another interesting point. Um, again, it's about how you monetize social media, really. Has it actually helped to increase your active customer base and actually drive turnover from your experience? Sure. So within our, um, within our actual customer base, within our community, we survey them regularly. And we know that as, as they are fans, it's increasing their frequency and loyalty of betting with Coral. And that more and more, they're becoming multi-channel customers. 
obviously a person who bets with us across more than one channel is a lot more profitable to us. Um, in terms of the actual advertising that we're running on Facebook and Twitter, we're seeing that it's highly cost effective in new customer acquisition. And obviously we measure those on the way that you would traditional digital media. So things like cost per depositor and LTV, and we're seeing great results. Excellent. Well, thank you all very much for that contribution. Some really interesting insights again there. If I could open it up to the floor, are there any uh, questions that any of you have for any of our panel? No, we don't seem to have any questions. Are you sure there's nothing we can open to the floor? If not, we will move on. But thank you very much to all of our panel. Oh, we have one, sorry. Indeed, <laughs> before we have the round of applause. Sorry, can someone pass the mic? Julian, you said 26% of apps are downloaded and then never used again. Do you have any information on why? Is it mispurchase? Is it they played it once, they didn't like it? Um, do you have any idea why that seems a very high number? Yeah, but that's it's they are opened once and never used again. Uh, that's because there is a lot of competition. Just on your phone, you can only see, I think, 12 or 15 apps at the time. And you know you are pushed all the time to install more, uh, more applications. And so if the app is not good enough, uh, when you have the first experience, you might never come back to that. And what actually takes you back to the application? It could be uh, uh, notifications, especially on iOS and on Android, uh, or advertising that you can see on, on, the, on, on the other mobile apps that you're using. So this is why the first impression that you make, the first experience that you provide has to be good enough so that people want to come back. There's nothing worse than providing a first and, uh, and disappointing experience to people who are using your application. But this is one of the you know, biggest challenges in the industry. How do you get people to not only install the application, but come back to it? Many times. Another question, just at the back. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, this is a question to Paul uh, Batar. Paul, say you're 16,000 um, Twitter followers, the BHA. How did you build that? Organically, or was there a an element of advertising? How did you build that base of, uh, of followers? Um, predominantly organically, Andrew. Um, we did some advertising through our website and we're actually, we've actually now realised that our, because of the way in which we use social media that our website is terribly out of date so we're actually going through a process of redoing our website. Um, and we will actually use our new website to more actively promote and advertise um, our, you know, our, our Twitter um, brand. Uh, one of the challenges for us in building our brand is that we're predominantly a regulatory body, so we're, we're slightly constrained by the way in which we can communicate and the way in which we can promote the sport to an extent. So even though we have a dual responsibility, predominantly we have a sort of governance and regulatory. Um, but the, the main way that we've built it is, is organically. And as I said, we do have a number of kind of key opinion formers that we use as a small direct group that we interact with to then talk about the sorts of topics and the way in which we can grow our social media um, following. It's probably also interesting to follow up there and talk about uh, the British Champions Series as well in the UK, which obviously is building up to its uh, climax in a couple of weeks' time with British Champions Day. And I see that they've engaged with uh, Michael Owen, who's probably the most followed racing celebrity, if you like, in the UK. And he acts now as their brand ambassador to help promote the British Champions Series in advance of British Champions Day, which again is leading to more followers, more likes, and attracting more people to actually even sell tickets. So, you know, the, there are th uh, the commercial arm, I think, if you like, of uh, uh, British racing is very active in this sector. Any other questions? If not, I'll say thank you again to our panel. Thank you very much.